for the biggest international camporee ever. Join 55,000 Pathfinders in an all-new location in Wyoming. In 2024, get ready for bigger campgrounds, more world records, special events, and incredible new activities. Join Pathfinders from all over the world and participate in daily parades, trade pins, earn honors, witness inspiring live evening programs featuring the story of Moses, and most of all, grow closer to Jesus Christ. Don't miss the 2024 International Pathfinder Camporee in Gillette, Wyoming.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another wonderful week here on Logos University Sabbath School. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is a glorious day to be in God's house. If you have made it through to the end of the week, <laughs> no matter what happened or went on this week, what happened on Monday is in the past. <laughs> what happened on Tuesday doesn't matter anymore. Wednesday and Thursday, oh, make them a blur. <laughs> we would want to say it is a good day to be in God's house. It's a wonderful day. It is a wonderful, wonderful day. It, it started to sprinkle a little bit as I was getting out of the car. And I was like, what? What's going on? <laughs> showers of blessings. So we'll take them. We will take the showers of blessings. Are there showers of blessings that are falling in your life? I sure do hope so, folks. Every day that we have an opportunity to breathe in and to breathe out is a blessing unto us. Another day that God has given us that we can share his good news. That's right. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. And who doesn't need to hear some good news in this time? I, I need some good news. Who else needs some good news? Put it in the chat that you need to hear some good news and you will not be disappointed as you study and dialogue here with us on Lagos University. Well, I'm not going to hold us up too much longer. We have Brother Calvin, who is here to minister to us in song. So as he comes, I want you to do something. That's right. Press that like, share, and subscribe button. And when you do that, you help us to get the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a dying world. That's right, folks. Folks, people are dying. Diseases are plaguing them, financial issues, just life itself. But you know another reason why they're dying? They are dying without hope because they have not heard of the hope that lives within you. And that is the hope of Jesus Christ. So when you press like, share, and subscribe, you help us to give others hope to live and to live in Christ. And that they can have eternal life. So do that for us. And as Brother Calvin comes, prepare your heart and your mind to receive God's word in song. Brother Calvin, come and bless our hearts this morning.
Amen, Brother Calvin. Thank you so much for your ministry in song this morning. What, what, what a song. I never would have made it. I never would have made it. <laughs> Is that on your heart this morning? Are you glad that you have made it through to this point? And it's not of your own accord that you made it, but it is because of Jesus Christ. Jesus paved the way. He moved some things out of your way this week that looked like they were insurmountable. He moved some things out of your way this week so that you can walk on higher ground. He moved some things out of your way this week so that you can make it to Sabbath. Give God some praise, some honor, and some glory because it's only through him that we have made it. Thank you for that reminder. And Brother Calvin, thank you. May God continue to bless you in your ministry. Well, folks, we are here one more time to do what God has asked us to do, and that is to share his word. And what a word we have for you this week. Before we move, I would want to remind you that our prayer warriors are standing by to take your prayer request and to even hear about the answers to your prayer. So please send your prayer request to intercessorsbda at gmail.com and our prayer warriors will get your prayers and they will pray with you and for you. Or you could put them here in the chat and we will pray with you and for you as we see them appearing in the chat. Well, we are on lesson 10. Can you believe it? Lesson 10. That means 10 weeks of the new year <laughs> has already gone by. We are in the month of March. And oh my gosh, March 2024 doesn't even sound right. But we are thankful that we are here. We are thankful that we have an opportunity to study God's word one more time and to be able to be here to share it with you. Lessons from the past. Lessons from the past is the title that we have been studying all week. Now, when we hear about the past, we usually hear about it in this form of history. So this is a history lesson this week. And um, history wasn't one of my favorite topics in school, subjects in school at all. Um, we managed to, to get by and get through it. But the thing about this history um, is that it reminds us of the faithfulness of God. It reminds us of all the things that happened with Israel, with God showing up for his people and, and his people <laughs> denying him his people worshiping idols, his people forgetting what he had done for them, and then having to repent. But God is a faithful God that he longs to bring us back into right fellowship with him. And when we think about this lesson, um, one of the things that comes back is that when we read these lessons and we hear them, we're told to share them with our children, to share them with the generations to come so that they can remember who God is and what he has done. And it helps us to remember what God has done for us. Have you ever thought this week as you went back, as you studied this lesson, where God has brought you from? When I think about where God has brought me from, I just can't <laughs> help but shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So as we study this lesson this week, I want you to think about what God has done for you in your life 
and where he is taking you in your life and what he's doing right now, what he is doing right now. What do you need him to do for you right now in your life? I know I need God to answer a very serious question in my life, and I know that he will do that for you because I know that in the past, when I've asked for those hard answers, God has shown up every time on time. And so our panel are right here standing by, ready to take us into our lesson study discussion for today. And so without further ado, we're going to ask Elder Garth Dixon to have our opening prayer. And then the next voice you will hear will be that of our abled moderator in the person of our head elder, Elder Joson Smith, will take us into our lesson study discussion for today. Elder Dixon, our Thank morning you, prayer. Sister B. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let us pray. Indeed, Father, we are cognizant of the fact that we never would have made it if it weren't for you through six days of toil and labor. And we are thankful and grateful, Lord, that you have brought us to this, your holy Sabbath day. <clears throat> Lord, even now as we are about to go into our lesson review, we ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will continue to tabernacle with us. I pray, Lord, that you will touch our minds, touch our brain cells. And so, Lord, even as we discuss and we share and we learn, it will help us, Lord, <clears throat> to be better Christians. We thank you, loving Father, for this opportunity that we have to share with the world the good news of salvation. I pray that as we share, hearts, souls, and minds will be blessed, and those, Lord, who need to give their lives to you will do so before it is too late. Bless us now and help us to have a good rest of the Sabbath. We pray in your name. Amen. Good morning again, and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you out there. We're so glad to have you <coughs> here with us on Lagos University at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church in our little island called Bermuda. We're so glad that each and every one of you are there. We see you on the chat, and we want you to know that the good news is on the way. Uh, my dear sister, who wants to hear some good news, the good news is on the way. But just before we uh, get right into this lesson, I just want to... Let some people know that our hearts are with them, uh, our prayers are with them. Uh, we want to uh, give our condolences to Vera Williams and Glenda Trott Williams on the loss of her son and Mr. Trott, her brother. So we want to let you know we're praying for you that the peace of God, the love of God will remain with you through this difficult time. And we also want to send our condolences out to the Anderson family. Uh, the family of Sister Tracy uh, Anderson, we want to let you know uh, our hearts go out with you and we love you, we're praying for you, all of you, the entire family. So may God continue to hold his hand around you and strengthen you at this difficult time. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. I had to uh, get that out there. So many people uh, experiencing struggles at this time in earth's history. Well, in every time in Earth's history, but in particular during this time as we, as we speed toward the very end of time. I just want us never to forget that. Well, we have our, 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 our elders and, and deacons back on our panel. I want to welcome back uh, our head deacon, head deacon Craig Utterbridge. Welcome yeah. back, sir. You know, he decided to go on a whole lot of trips and, <laughs> and travel all over the world while the rest of us had to... Tough it out here in Bermuda. So hopefully you had an awesome, awesome time. I uh, had Deacon Craig. I did. And uh, we're going to get into this lesson. And uh, as, as, you can, as you will see, 
very shortly, uh, I, I made him pay for, for uh, taking those vacations. He's, he's first up. <laughs> but before we, we get there, uh, we're going to look at this lessons of the past. This is such a vital thing to think about. Right. And the fact that the, the word past is one thing. But the word that I think we need to focus on is lessons. Mm -hmm. Have we learned from our past so that our future is not the same as our past? That, that is the question. Our memory text today, uh, taken from Psalm 78, verse 3 and 4, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them. From their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Ah, oh, brothers and sisters, I want to just go real quick to uh, just a verse prior to this because it, it gives some understanding. Uh, uh, verse 1 says, Give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And then this second verse says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Uh, then it gets to talk about those, those things we want to tell to their children. What I saw out of this, at first I'm like, dark sayings? What, what is this all about, uttering dark sayings uh, from our past? Well, this word, this uh, phrase, dark sayings, is, Kido, kido, it means difficult, a difficult question or perplexing saying, right? So what I got out of that is that it's saying, don't hide even the difficult things from their children. I like it where he says their children too, because grandparents, uh, you, you got you to gotta pass on things, all of these things you pass to your children, you got to pass it on to their children as well. So in each generation, we got to let them know our failures. Uh, even the dark things, the hard things, the perplexing things that we've experienced and gone through. God wants us to share these things of our children so that their future is not the same as our past. And we're going to get into this today. I, I love this topic, actually. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to learning from our panel and things that uh, they bring out of this lesson. You know, what God wants us to do is tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly. He wants to tell them the, the good, bad, and the ugly. But in, in doing so, what the scripture points out is that we ought to tell them the strength and wonderful works of God of how He got us where we are today. That's what they need to know. They need to understand the, the, the mistakes we've made, but they need to understand the praises that we give to God because of how wonderful He has been in changing our characters in bringing us out of that place where we used to be, and now we're in a whole new place. That's what our children need to understand about God, that He doesn't leave you and condemn you where you are. No, God is trying to bring you further than where we, are, where we were into where we are today. And even where we are today, there are steps even further on that years from now we wouldn't even be who and what we are today. We won't be exactly the same. We'll be better versions of ourselves. Amen? So teach them, teach them, repeat these things to them. They may know, do not. And I, you know, I, even before we start, mm -hmm. what kind of parents or friends or co-workers would we be if we encourage others to repeat what we know was our failure? How could we be good Christians? If we teach our children to repeat our flaws, you know, you know, some of us have smart mouths. I know I, I had a smart mouth at one point. I had a smart mouth, <laughs> but I'm not going to teach my children to have a smart mouth. You know, oh sure, stand when you need to stand for Christ, but don't get it twisted. You just don't satisfy that thing inside you because you have the capacity to be rude and smart. No, no, we don't teach our children to repeat our failures but to be better Christians, better husbands, better wives than us. And I'm going to come right over here to 
to, 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 to Deacon Steve because before uh, before you even get in, head Deacon, he's he's got something to say. I'm ready, re rearing and ready to hear it. Go ahead. I also I also learned um, Elder Smith with with when we're looking at this memory text and where it tells us which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide. We will not hide them from their children. So this part, we will not hide. It caused me to it caused me to think about where Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 he says I am not ashamed of the gospel mm. so it caused me to think as long yes we definitely know we've all done some things that we're definitely sorry for but how about when that gospel comes to us what part of that are we ashamed of and why why are we ashamed of it that's something to contemplate. Mm, amen. We're going to get right into it. We're coming right to you right now. we got to ask uh, Head Deacon Craig to take us into Sunday's lesson. The Lord's unstoppable faithfulness. I am I. Psalm 78, <coughs> verses 5 to 8. Take us there. It says, for he has, <coughs> excuse me. It says, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, should also arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Um, just before we get into that, you mentioned uh, Sunday's lesson, and where it says, um, which we have heard and known. The Bible also says that there will be a time when they will hear and not uh, understand, or yes. they will hear and not really hear. So it's, it's mandatory that we not only teach these things, but we teach our children how to listen mm. so mm. that what they hear, they understand as well. But in Sunday's lesson, for me, it pointed out that one of the greatest gifts given to the world is God's word. And Israel had the advantage of it being committed to them. As Paul wrote in Romans 3, 2, it says he committed to them his word, the oracles of God. Then and now God gives his word so that it would be given to future generations, but not just passed on, but taught and taught in such a way that those who are taught will also teach, and so on and so on. It should be taught in such a way that one would learn to trust in God for themselves. It's more than just knowing the actions that took place, but it's about seeing the heart of those who were rebellious and teaching the heart to love God, not just obey. Christ's faithfulness was more than just showing up, living perfect, and going to the cross. Christ's faithfulness was all about love. The Bible tells us he was faithful, but God is love. And I just want to share that, um, share this point to emphasize God's love. It says, the Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but which was infinite love permitted for the blessings of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. And all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love 
God. Now, some people might not have got that or gotten what I was trying to express in that paragraph. So I'd like to emphasize two very important points. We are told that Christ accepted everything as coming from whose hand? The Father's. So you mean <clears throat> that when they spat in his face, he accepted that as coming from his Father. Are you ready to go that far? So you mean <clears throat> when they planted a crown of thorns and put it upon his brow and crushed it down and the blood coursed down his face, he accepted that as coming from his father. You mean when they took him to the hill in Nazareth and tried to push him off, he accepted this as coming from his father. Yes, he accepted every solitary experience that touched his life as coming directly from his father. Here was his source of comfort, and it is the same for us today. Even when things may seem to be at the worst, God is faithful, and he is so loving that he uses our suffering to draw us to him because it was his suffering that saved us. I just want to share this, that when my mother took sick, I, I, I was angry at God. How could he do this? But over the years, I came to realize that what my mother went through brought not only her to Christ, but it also brought me to Christ. Had that not happened, was my mother living a life that would have been faithful to Christ? No. Was I living a life that would have been faithful to Christ? By no means. But through those circumstances and through those sufferings, Christ draw, drew us to him. And I accepted that what he was doing was for the benefit of not only my mother, but for me as well. He could have wiped my mother out when she had that stroke because she only had a 10% chance of survival. But she survived another 11 years after that. And she was able to see her son come to Christ, her son get married, and witness, um, spend some time with her grandchild. So through the sufferings, the goodness of God was extended to us. And we have to look at the bigger picture and not just the immediate sufferings that we're going through. So like Paul, um, like it says in the Bible, count it all joy when we fall amongst various trials because they are a testing of our faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother, Amen. that is a very deep perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I believe as soon as we get to the point of trusting God through everything, knowing that somehow, some way, he's working that out for our good. I think what happens is we expect everything to be only good, mm -hmm. and when things aren't only good, it impacts our view yeah. and relationship with our Father. Yeah. But that is a very deep perspective to accept all that he permits in our lives. Mm -hmm. Not just the good things, but even those things that try us and test us and don't feel very good, that God somehow, and, and it's not to say, don't get it twisted, there's not to say that God um, just wants that for us. He wants all these bad things. That, no, that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is we live in a world of sin. We cannot, we cannot disassociate that from this whole picture. Sin is still a part of the picture. The consequences of sin is still a part of our existence. So, brothers and sisters, that is a very, I, I pray that a head deacon, uh, what he just said, you will take to heart that accept the things that God permits in our lives. But the, the, the key is the lesson, the lesson, search for it, look for it, find the lesson and become what God is using this experience to make you into. Surrender to it. Listen. I, 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 this concept is very deep, but I want to hit on something here. 
This thing about learning lessons from our past, in terms of what we're initially looking at here, we're looking at the learning lessons from the mistakes of others' mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, it says the fathers, right? But I want to ask us, do we learn from our own past? Mm -hmm. The mistakes of our own past, brothers? Mm -hmm. Think about this. We must teach our children to be better than their fathers. Mm -hmm. Better than their father. But how many children and wives and men suffer as a result of what their fathers did? I'll, I'll make it clear. In other words, and, 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 and let me tell you, I, I, I know this experience personally, so I'm not speaking about anybody else. I like to bring out these realities because I have gone through many of these things, right? Husbands and wives are being punished for the failures of parents and grandparents who don't even live in the same household as them anymore. Mm -hmm. Some of these people are dead and gone, but our children suffer as a result of their failures. Mm -hmm. Instead of us, because uh, 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 I like to ask, and this is the question that God posed to me. I'm going to stick with me. This is the question he posed to me at a point in my life, in my marriage. He said, Manny, did you like the thing that happened in your household that impacted you in this way? Did you like it as a child? Mm -hmm. Did you just you say, awesome, mom and dad, thank you for that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or did it hurt you and impact you in ways that, that now causes you to react to other people out of that experience? And I, and I thought about it. I said, you know, I didn't like that. I, I hated that part in my life. And this is the question God asked me, and it woke me up. Mm -hmm. If you didn't like that experience, Manny, what makes you think that your children will? If you didn't like that experience, if you didn't like what happened to your mom or your auntie or whoever you watched in life go through things, if you didn't like that, what makes you think that your wife will like it? And so we repeat, we don't learn from our history. Often we repeat our history. And our children and our families suffer and struggle and are punished because of what great grandfather did and grandfather did. Sometimes great great grandfather and grandma and mom and dad who have their own lives. Now we, we, we cause our families to be punished because of their error. No, brothers and sisters, what God had to teach me was, many. you have no excuse anymore. You're a grown man with your own family to make your own decisions. You have your own job, your own car, your own house. You have all of these. You cannot use them as your excuse any longer. You need to give your children and your family what they need in spite of what impacted you. And so I want to encourage you out there, especially us men. I've been hitting on the men for a couple of weeks. Especially us men. Do not hold back love and compassion and, and, and patience and joy and peace and all these things from our families because we were impacted by the mistakes of our parents and grandparents. Your children and wife don't deserve that. They deserve to get everything that God has, 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 has had for them. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was listening for Acts. I was wondering if, if it's possible, could you share, like, what would what, what cause one to not see that, to not see the hurt that the cause, and to not see mm. the pain that the cause, and to be blind. Could, could ah. you share that? Yeah, well, I know, well, I could share what, what it was for me. It was just this awakening, and I don't claim to have the answers to everybody, mm. but it was just this awakening of why I am the way I am. Mm -hmm. I had to stop and deal with this, the things, and I could actually trace it back to a moment in time. That thing that crushed me inside, it crushed my spirit. It, it did something to me that it affected the way, and for me, it was the way I treated women. It affected me deeply, and I passed it on and on. And it was not until God made me aware, hey, do you know why you act like that? Mm -hmm. It's not because that's who you are, because in fact, your personality is entirely different from that. But this experience has caused you to say, Ain't no woman can ever hurt me. 
They're never going to hurt me. I'm not, you, you get hurt first before I get hurt. And that was my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, not until marriage and wife and children, all these things. I was in my 40s before God said, hey, you need to face this thing down, man. You are making your family suffer for something that you don't even have to keep going through. Mm -hmm. Understand it. And once I understood it and where it came from and why it happened, mm -hmm. it was only then I could smile at my wife and hug my wife and release myself to my children. And my, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So and that, was, that was the answer for me. Yeah, Dean Craig. I, I, I want to say people are comfortable in <clears throat> knowing who they are. And they have this, this um, understanding that this is who I am. And, and, and they get, like I say, comfortable in that. But Christ takes us to a place of being uncomfortable because we have to be uncomfortable mm. with, with the unknown of the future. <clears throat> and that allows us to pour our trust into him because we don't know the future. And when we let go of everything and trust in God, then we start to see his faithfulness in his word reveal itself to us. And he removes that ill nature and starts to show us who he has ordained us to be. The Bible says, I knew you before you were born, but we don't know ourselves. So once we re release and let everything go, we come to this place <clears throat> where Christ starts to show us who he has ordained us to be. And sometimes the hardest thing in life is to let go of what yes. we know or who we think we are and allow ourselves to be who Christ has called us to be, because that might be a totally different person than we even anticipated or could even fathom. Mm, hey, beautiful, man, beautiful. I mean, just imagine this. We're talking about the unstoppable faithfulness of God. What are we, what are we to learn from that past in terms of Sunday's lesson? What are we to learn? Imagine uh, uh, showing someone deep, and some of us have experienced this, showing someone deep, sincere, love and kindness right and having that person that you, you you direct all that love and kindness toward spit in your face like you've done nothing for mm -hmm. and just treat you and, and demand more and more of you and treat you badly over and over and over and over what is the lesson the lesson here is that that's what our forefathers did to god mm -hmm. But his faithfulness was unstoppable. What is the lesson? For us, I believe the lesson is we need to learn unstoppable faithfulness like that. Unstoppable faithfulness like that. Because had God not been that way to me, or to you, or to you, if God had not been that way, where in the world would we be? Yeah. Monday's lesson. Looking forward to this out of God. Remembering history and the praise of God. Remember your history and the praise of God. Here's where we get to tell them the right thing to do. Amen. And God's faithfulness. Psalms 105, 42 to 45. Psalm 105, 42 to, 42 to 45 says, For he remembered his holy promise, and Abram his servant, and he brought forth his people with joy, and his and is chosen with gladness and gave them the lands of the Eden and they inherited the labor of the people that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws praise ye the Lord Psalm 105 stands as a testament to God's unwavering covenantal relationship with his people tracing back to his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob regarding the inheritance of the promised land. This divine covenant realized through the lives of key figures like Joseph, Moses, and Aaron, and even the conquest of Canaan serves, my friends, not only as a historical narrative, but also as a beacon of hope for believers across all mm. generations showcasing God's faithfulness and his providential care. Central 
to the message of Psalm 105 is the call to praise God through the remembrance of history. A similar sentiment, friend, is expressed in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 7, which urges believers to remember the days of old, to consider the years of many generations, and to ask their fathers who will teach them. Understanding on reflecting and reflecting on our historical journey as God's people serves to validate our faith and provides abundant reasons for heartfelt worship and praise. In contrast to Psalm 78, which highlights Israel's failings, Psalm 105 focuses on the resilience and the faithfulness of the patriots, illustrating how their steadfastness was met with divine reward. This serves, my friends, as a strong motivation to believers such as you and me to emulate their faith and trust in God's provision and timing, as exemplified in Hebrews 10 and verse 36, which encourages perseverance, stating, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done, done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. The hymnal tone in Psalm 105 highlights the importance of praising God with a comprehensive understanding of our shared history. It shows us, friends, the connection between our faith and God's intervention on behalf of his people, which aligns perfectly with Colossians 3 and verse 16, which urges believers to let the word of Christ dwell in them richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in their hearts to God. Addressing worshippers as the descendants of Abraham and Jacob emphasizes the continuity between the patriots and subsequent generations of God's chosen people. This, friends, reinforces God's promise to make Abraham a great nation and remind us, you and I, as believers, of our role in fulfilling that promise in keeping with Galatians 3 and verse 29, which proclaims, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Here's according to his promise. Mm -hmm. And finally, Psalm 105 calls believers of every generation to remain faithful by reflecting on our shared history and the faithfulness of God throughout the ages we find strength and encouragement to endure in our own faith journey this invitation my friends to praise God for his enduring love and faithfulness throughout history is in, is reinforced in Psalm 154 which declares our generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Through this collective remembrance and celebration, we find, friends, assurance and inspiration to navigate life's challenges with unwavering faith, knowing, knowing that our God is eternally faithful to his promises. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 I like that because, again, oftentimes, <laughs> and just going on back to your, back to your, 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 your point, Elder, oftentimes we focus on the wrong part of our history. Very often. I mean, even in our relationships, right? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago that sometimes, you know, ladies, you know, we, 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 we we, we, we go through stuff, we deal with it, and then as soon as something happens, everything that was past comes back, right? <laughs> Sometimes true. we remember and focus on the wrong part. <clears throat> so I'm so glad that this lesson actually begins to bring out God's faithfulness in all this, not just focusing on uh, the mistakes that his people made or that we've made, but that his faithfulness, because that's the lesson I believe he's trying to get us to learn, is to be faithful through it all. Even when people hurt you, and, and listen, it's, I know this is kind of 
uh, are sensitive because some people have had some hurt. I, I don't think I want to deal with it. So, and I don't know how I would deal with it, right? But, but in principle, you know, I'm saying that God wants us to, to be able to, to, to be faithful through them. Because in the end, what he's shaping us into is something far greater than we currently can see or understand. Amen. And I know this to be true, Elder. Uh, uh, because, and that's why we can't just tell our children failures all the time. Mm -hmm. We actually need to pay attention to the mercies and the grace of God that, that brought us out of things and how it has affected us and why their life is different. I know for me, in, 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 in my own home, you know, I worked I, I, I put it like I work very hard out, so that my children experience a particular environment. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everything in my childhood was, was trash. No, I had, some, ooh, I had some awesome parents, man. But, you know, I, I wanted certain things in my home to be entirely different. I didn't want my children to experience certain things or hear certain things. So uh, I, I had to wrestle and grapple with myself in order to remove that. And then I can actually see the difference in my children. Since they have not experienced certain things, it's not even a, it's not even a thought in their mind. And so that's the beauty part. I get to be able to tell them the wonderful things that God done in my life, and you are a, re a recipient of those awesome things. And that's how they get to see God. I come to you right quick. And then out of Garfield, we got to move on Tuesday's lesson. I know it's a hot topic. <laughs> yes, I, I was thinking in the same in the same um, idea as you were you were saying. I was Smith, where it reminded me of in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter eleven, at the end of the chapter in verse thirty nine, it says, "And these men of faith, because it, it's we also learned in in Psalm one hundred five that that God kept, remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those that had already." Past, right? But it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, And these men of faith, though they trusted God and won his approval, none of them received all that God had promised ah, them. Yes, sir. I mean, so that's what this lesson also taught me. Are we willing to put in the work of faithfulness, righteousness, steadfastness for the benefit of future generations? So mm. we're looking to invest now as you said, so that the others, our children and our grandchildren, yes. may reap this benefit. Amen, amen. Out of God? Yes, Ella. Just uh, as to reinforce the point regarding how important our, our history is and how, how it's, it's good for us to refer back to history because it helps us as we go forward. I, am, I, I re remember there was a famous quote by, um, I think it's uh, Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican national hero. He says, uh, that says, uh, 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 a people without a knowledge of their past is like a tree without roots. And we know what the root does mm. for the tree. It keeps it firm, yes, right? It prevents it from falling over. Uh, but the idea really is that we focus on those aspects of history that will help us to move forward rather than uh, cause us to repeat the same things over Absolutely. and over again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's not repeat the hurt. Let's not repeat the bad family situations. Let's mm -hmm be better than our children. I want my children to be better than me in every way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean every, and I pray it, Lord, make them better in every way. I don't care if it's financially, socially, physically, every single way, make them better than me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We've got to move on to Tuesday's lesson. Uh, Deacon Steve, take All us right. to Tuesday's lesson, remembering <clears throat> history and repentance. Oh, boy, and repentance. 106, chapter, uh, verse 13 and verse 21. All right, uh, Psalm 106 says in verse 13, They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Mm. Mm -hmm. So in this lesson, um, one key thing that, that stood out for me was to notice the possible consequences that we might have to face when we forget God's blessings. And we can see in um, Psalm 106, and in verse 1, the psalmist, he reflects, or the psalmist reflects on the praises of God for all that he's done in the past. And then verse 3 tells us 
what we can do right now, what we can do right now to emulate God and reflect his image. It says in Psalm 106 verse 3, it says, happiness comes to those who are fair to others and are always just and good. So we see something that we could do, we can do right now. And then it goes on in verse 6, it says the Israelites, they went back and forth disobeying God. We can see this in this, para, in this psalm. They went back and forth disobeying God. But God, one thing that they also, I noticed in verse 13, that they didn't wait for God to act himself. So even in this disobedience of going back and forth, one of the things was, well, why wouldn't you give God a try? to act in your life, you know? And, and it reminded me of, of, as the psalm went on, to notice that which would, which would be worst? Those, as, as we even now reflect and look at this psalm and we read about the past of others, which is worse for those who committed these heinous sins of to read about it and repeat it? Which is worse? That's something really to think about, you know? But we, we, we have the blessing to know that, that when we see these past sins that people commit, we see these past things that people have done, that God's grace abounds much more than these sins. And what I'm learning that with this is that we consistently see God referring back to Egypt. And I think one of the reasons why is because it was such a break from sin yeah. that God provides. You know, and he gives us that today. And it made me also think about when we look at Jesus that was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, Satan came to Jesus three times saying, if, 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 which is conditional. It's not, it's not bound, we're not bound and, and, and locked in to our sins by Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ says, all power is given unto me, so therefore go. So we have this blessing of looking back at these, this psalm, and we're actually also encouraged to actually read it once a week. Mm. Inspiration tells us to read this once a week because it's, see, we all have a past, and by the grace of God, God has been in our past, but are we actually utilizing that power that he gives us? Amen, amen. I'm going li to li listen to this scripture text. Okay. Listen to this scripture text, and, and it's in Psalm 106, mm -hmm. verse 34 and 35, right? Uh, actually, I'll start from verse 33. He says, because they provoked his spirit mm -hmm. so that he spake inadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nation concerning whom the Lord commanded them, mm -hmm. but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. Mm -hmm. Why do I point this out? Because in terms of our history and repentance, this, these two scriptures tell me that's not what we do today. We, instead of destroying the things that God has told us to remove out of our lives, that thing mommy taught us, that thing daddy taught us, that thing grandpa did, like if we don't destroy those things completely out of our lives but mingle with them, right, then we learn their works and repeat them. And what, what did that do? That provoked God's spirit. And their punishment came. Why am I saying this? The lessons from the past for us is do not mingle and learn the ways, the wrong ways from your fathers in the past. Your mother, your father, the people you love, they did wrong too. Just like us, our children have got to grow up and deal with stuff that we've done wrong and change it in their lives. But we need to be better continually, generation after generation, these folk did not destroy it all. They held on to stuff. They let it live. And what God is telling us is let self die. You must completely destroy it. Don't mingle with it. Don't learn its ways. Don't hold on. Let it go. Let me make you to what you need to be. We've got to move <coughs> on to Wednesday's lesson. The parable of the Lord's vine. You, you're still up, Deacon still Steve. Up. The Don't parable of the Lord's vine. <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 80, verses 14 All and 15. Right. Take us there. Okay, Psalm 80, verse 14. Return, we bespeech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold, and visit this vine, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, 
and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. And in this parable, um, in Psalm, this Psalm, um, Psalm 80, it's considered a parable, the parable of the Lord's vine. And in the book of Psalms, we find a very special, this parable, where Israel is compared to a vineyard that God moved from Egypt, planted in Canaan, and made it grow from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. Over the course of time, God allowed this vineyard to be neglected and his enemies to enter it and destroy it. And for this reason, the psalmist begs the shepherd of Israel to arise and to save. In verse 3, the psalmist says, Turn us again to yourself. And then in verse 7, the psalmist says, Turn again to yourself. Come back, we beg of you, in verse 14. And then verse 18 of this psalm, it, the psalmist is saying, Receive us to trust in you, God. The psalm parable reminds us of the marvelous work that God does for us. He frees us from bondage, removes barriers from our life, and firmly establishes us, doing everything we need to grow and prosper spiritually. When we begin to act as if we don't need God, we can find ourselves overcome by internal and also external forces. And we must realize that without God's help, even when we seem to be doing well, we are in danger of a fall. Mm -hmm. Our recovery from sin and our relationship with God needs constant attention. And this psalm parable ends with a plea. Turn us again, O Lord of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Shine his face? What does that mean? This reminds us that when we feel beaten down, God's mercy and restorative grace is available to us. Even though we feel overwhelmed by our suffering, remember God can bring an end to all that causes so much pain. He forgives us and he forgives, he gives us our strength and restores us to wholeness and wants us to share with others the good news about how he delivered us. And as we share the message of God's deliverance, others will begin to hope in God's power and we'll find our own recovery to strengthen us. Amen, amen. amen. We need Praise to recover. Yeah. Our families need to recover. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, I want to add this here in there, uh, Deacon Steve, because uh, I don't want people to uh, get to this point where they, because you know, part of the lesson of the past is actually coming to a place of understanding and forgiveness of those who hurt us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. See, I came to understand that if it was difficult for me to deal with something that I experienced as a young man and to get it out of my life, then it hit me. It dawns on me. Well, my parents are experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're having a difficult time dealing with and removing those things of their experience mm -hmm. out of their life. Mm -hmm. And so I actually began to have compassion for those who made mistakes toward me. Mm -hmm. I actually had compassion. So like, if I'm struggling this hard and it took me this many years to overcome that experience, if they had that same experience, it's no wonder. It's no wonder they didn't even know how to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But by God's grace, he helped me to understand it. So now I can deal with it, but now my heart goes out to even my own parents. Like, wow, you. When I learn more and more about some of their past experiences and their childhood, I say, oh, wow. The fact that you are <laughs> as good as you are <laughs> is an amazing thing. So God helped me to, 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 to see that differently. For some of us, it will help us to be more loving and forgiving toward those who hurt us. Amen. To understand it, well, it's not easy for them either. By God's grace, we've got to the point where we've dealt with it. But they, they may not have reached that, or they may never reach it. They may never actually reach it, but, but I cannot allow my life to always be impacted by someone else's mistake. Because really, I can go mm. past them to their parents, and I can go past them to their parents. And so I'm not going to allow my life to continue 
in that vein. But stop it with me. Stop it right here. The generation after me will not experience that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's forgive one another and let's move forward. We got to go on to uh, a Thursday's lesson out of God. The Lord's supremacy in history. His supremacy in history. Uh, it ties all in with all what came before it. So we're looking forward to this. Psalm 135, verse 5 and 6. Psalm 135, 5 to 6 says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. As I uh, reflect on Thursday's lesson, I, I wanted to just briefly uh, look at what the, the theme means, uh, the Lord's supremacy in history. What really does that mean? And to me, the Lord's supremacy refers to the belief in the ultimate authority and sovereignty of God over all creation. Mm. It signifies that God is above all powers, rulers, and authority, authorities, and that his will prevails over everything in the universe, Amen. in the past, in the present, and it will continue in the future. So as followers of Christ, we have inherited a magnificent legacy. Just as God chose Israel to be his special treasure in Psalm 135 and verse 4, we too are called to be a set-apart people. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 tells us, it's a very beautiful passage which says, chosen generation, we aren't chosen because we are inherently better, but because God has a purpose for us. In, in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 5, it tells us that. Royal priesthood. We have, you and I, we have direct access to God through prayer and through worship. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 tells us that. Holy nation. We are called to live a life set apart from worldly influences, mm -hmm. reflecting God's character. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8 tells us that. Peculiar people, we are, we, are, we are God's unique possession, entrusted with sharing his message to the world. Titus 2 and verse 14 tells us that. Now, with all of this, this doesn't, shouldn't rather, breed superiority, mm -hmm. but rather responsibility among us. We are entrusted, friends, with the message of God's redeeming love in Christ. John 3 and verse 16 tells us, tells us that clearly, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, friends, fulfilling this responsibility involves sharing this message with the world. This call to reject idolatry in Psalm 135 resonates deeply for us today. The idols of old may be gone, but the psalmist warning against misplaced devotions remains relevant even today. Mm -hmm. Idolatry isn't just worshiping statues. It's anything that takes the place of God in our hearts. How... Now, now, here's how idolatry can manifest in our lives. Let's, let's quickly look at a few of them. Materialism. Placing excessive value on possessions, wealth, or status. Matthew 6 and verse 19 tells us that. Self-reliance is also another one. Trusting in our own abilities more than God's, guide, God's guidance. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 tells us that. And also in comparison. Envying other, others' possessions. Our, achieve, our achievements diminishing our diminishes rather our gratitude for God's blessing in our own life. The Bible is filled with reminders of God's rightful place as the sole object of worship. 
The first commandment declares this. You shall have no other gods before me. This isn't just about worshipping other deities. It is about recognizing that nothing deserves our ultimate devotion except God. The psalmist echoed this very sentiment when he proclaims, For you are great, O Lord, and do wondrous things. You alone are God. God's greatness and power, friends, deserve our complete awe and reverence. Finally, let us, friends, like the psalmist in uh, Psalm 135, raise our voices in joyful praise to the one who reigns supreme throughout history. <clears throat> our worship should be a reflection of his immense power as creator, as seen in Romans 1 and verse 25, and his unfailing love as our redeemer, as in John 3 and verse 16. By turning our hearts fully towards him, we fulfill the legacy entrusted to us and join the chorus of praise that will forever resound to the one true God. Amen, amen. Out of, I, I got I to <coughs> talk about a comment that I see on the chat here. It's just the Angela Mosca. Uh, praise God for this comment because I think she, she kind of hits it. It's a word she uses. I'm going to read it. It says, uh, amen. The cycle, although painful, will repeat itself in the lives of each of us if not intentionally addressed. Mm -hmm. Only Jesus can help us. Amen. I just wanted to, to put intentionally addressed. And it's the same with what Elder Garth is talking about. We must intentionally uh, contemplate and view God for who he really is. It don't just happen. Some of us quit in our Christian walk because things are not just happening. But to go and study is an intentional effort on our part. To see God in his majesty, in his greatness, is an intentional uh, 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 effort on our part to be quiet and to imagine and to think and listen to his spirit. To keep still. It's intentional. And so if we don't intentionally address these things of the past, if we don't intentionally look at them and, and, and reason and find out why and how and who and what was this all about and what's the lesson from then it'll, it, then we are doomed to repeat it. Doomed to repeat it. But I want us to understand something and go back to what Elder Garth was talking about. He mentioned this thing about idols, right? I know, even for me personally, one of the things that became an idol to me, and I, and I, I wondered why God made it all stop working, and it, it, it went backwards, and I couldn't use it, and all kinds of things happened until one day, he had to say to me, do you even realize how much you love that thing? For me, out it was boats. Oh, my <laughs> gracious. Oh, boats was like, oh, I didn't realize. I, when I tell you, I had an attachment to this boat. I loved that thing. To a level that I didn't realize until God took it away. When he took it away, I went into a state of depression. I would sit on the docks and watch everyone drive in and out of the bay, just wishing to myself, why? Oh, couldn't, it be, couldn't I just have... And one day while I was sitting there looking at this particular boat, it sounds simple, but it was very deep. I was looking at this particular boat and the spirit, and I was, I was like, oh, oh, look at, oh, man. And the Spirit said to me, are you listening to yourself? Do you even understand how deeply you love this thing? That's why I've taken it away. Mm. Mm. And it was, I kid you not, it was years before I accepted that, Lord, what, okay, I don't need anything you don't want me to have, no problem. It took years. Because going back, all of these points come back, even to what you, you said, Head Deacon, you said, you know, that trusting God, even with the bad things, trusting his character, that if he's permitted it, 
There's a purpose ahead of us that is for our good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. You understand? Yeah. Where I am now with things is that God had to show me I must detach your love of the world from you. Mm -hmm. The day is coming when you will have to make a decision between me and the world. And mm. if you have an attachment to it, you're going to do whatever it takes to keep it. And you might just accept the mark of the beast to keep that thing mm. if they threaten to take it away. Mm. I have to remove that from you. Trust me. Let me take it from you. It hurts. It's frustrating. It's depressing. You worked all your life for it. And trust me when I tell you, I worked my whole life for that <laughs> boot. <laughs> right? I had had boots from the time I was about five years old. That's all I, I loved it. And God said, let me take it. Because if I don't, you will not make it. Mm. Mm. So brothers and sisters, this, this is a beautiful lesson. An absolutely beautiful lesson. God's supremacy. Let him have the supremacy. And allow whatever he thinks is necessary in your life to save you. How to God. The supremacy. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, indeed. Uh. Huh? Let him be in charge. Stop trying to be in charge. He knows how to save you. Whatever he takes from you, thank him. Because somehow, some way, it's making you into a state of mind that's savable. Mm -hmm. If you surrender to it, if you learn the lesson from the past. Amen? Amen. Well, Amen. we're going to close out uh, 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 Head Deacon Craig. Take us through Friday's lesson. Friday's lesson. Amen. Um, in reading Acts 7, what this shows us is Israel's constant rebellion and not actually letting God have supremacy, where they were actually trying to work things out for themselves. But in doing so, they were in constant rebellion. And Stephen continuously points that out, even right up to him being martyred. And then when we look at Hebrews 11, we know this to be the, the faith chapter, and it shows the faithful, those who, who remained faithful to Christ and stood for God's word and continue to share God's word and, and live according to God's word, what God actually done through them because of their faith in Christ. But I just want to share this. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God. Stand, therefore, stand there, and don't let yourself be moved from this position. As long as you do not rebel against God and turn your back on God, God will never turn his back on you. Remember that you may make mistakes, but Jesus said he has made provisions for that. Mm -hmm. Not planned that you should, but if you do. He says, my little children, I would, that, I would that you sin not. But if you sin, praise God. He has a plan. He said, if we sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that if we confess our sins, our Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous, is willing to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He keeps the record clean. Amen. Uh, uh, that deacon, sir, I'll tell you what. Thank God the record is clean. Amen. Our job is to try to keep it clean. <laughs> Amen. We can do it. So I'm going to encourage you out there, brothers and sisters, do not return to your bump. Mm -hmm. mm. Don't return to your bump. If you recognize it as vomit, if it smells like vomit, if it looks like vomit, stay away from vomit. Don't return like a dog to his vomit. 
and those sins of the past, those mistakes of the past, those, that's the vomit. God is saying, don't return to it. Let's move forward. Let's keep going. In order for us to understand where we need to go, we must know the, the path. But it is not to have dominion of us in that way. Amen? And I just want to share this before we close out, mm -hmm. that the God that we know who looked forward in the future gave us lessons in the past to encourage us in the present today. Amen. 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 Close us out in prayer. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for uh, your faithfulness to us, Father. We all now who have uh, sinned at some point in our lives, Father, may we ask for forgiveness. Put ourselves um, in front of you, Father, to, to cleanse us through your righteousness. Keep us now. Bless us as we go forward here today. Bless the word that shall be shared. Bless the pastors, um, the service that we will uh, be partaking of today. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sunday. Blessings, family and friends. Pastor Tull here. On behalf of our wonderful membership here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bermuda, we are grateful for your presence and participation in today's Lagos University. I pray you have been deeply blessed by the exploration of God's Word during this time. You see, engaging in such interactions like our Sabbath school lesson allows us to draw closer to Jesus. As a congregation, our ultimate goal is to help each individual enter into an intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sharing a changed life that radiates His love to the world. And so it is truly an experience like no other as we prepare for the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In light of this, I would like to offer our assistance in serving you better. If you require more information about Logos University, please feel free to contact us by texting the number, as you see on the screen, 441-517-5810. If you need prayer support, please send your prayer request. Two, as you see on the screen, intercessorsbda at gmail.com. Rest assured, someone will fervently be praying for you. We also invite you to join our weekly prayer meeting service every Wednesday at 6.30 in the evening, where we will dedicate time to pray for your requests, either publicly or privately. Moreover, if you have the opportunity, we will be delighted to meet you in person. Our church is located at 43 King Street, Hamilton, on the beautiful island of Bermuda. And so join us for a vibrant Sabbath school experience every Saturday, Sabbath morning at 9.15 a.m., suitable for all ages, followed by a God-centered worship service at 11 o'clock a.m. Although virtual worship has its merits, being physically present in our church adds an immeasurable depth to the experience. And so lastly, if you would like to find out more about our church family, engage in fellowship, or provide words of encouragement or support through donations, please email us, as you see on the screen, at hamiltonsda at gmail.com. Or you can even call us at 441-292-4276. Or you can visit our website at www.hamiltonsda.org. We eagerly look forward to hearing from you. Until we connect again, may God's presence not only dwell with you, but also within you, guiding and blessing your every step of the way. May God bless you. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Colon cancer, also known as colorectal cancer, is the third most common cancer worldwide. You are at a greater risk for colon cancer if you are older than the age of 50, if you have a family history of colon cancer or if you practice unhealthy lifestyle habits such as drinking excessive alcohol, having a diet high in red meat and processed meats, smoking tobacco or having an elevated BMI. 
Symptoms of colon cancer include bloody stool, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Persistent diarrhea or constipation, unexplained weight loss and constant fatigue. How can you help to prevent colon cancer? Eat a healthy diet high in fruits and vegetables, stay active or exercise, avoid unhealthy lifestyle habits and get regular screenings such as colonoscopies. For more information visit www.cancer.com or ask your doctor if you meet the criteria for colon cancer screening. 60% of colon cancer deaths could be prevented with screening. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Here are the announcements for today and the upcoming week. Special prayer for all the families that have lost loved ones. We extend our deepest condolences to the family and friends of Stanford E.E. E. Thomas, Mary Basden and Archie Douglas. In our conference news. The Munich Conference Women's Ministry invites you to a prayer breakfast at the Hamilton Princess on Sunday, March 10 from 9.30 a.m. The Munich Conference Children's Ministry presents Football Under the Stars on March 16, 7.30 p.m. at BFA Field. Ages 5 to 18 are eligible to play. Bermuda Conference invites you to a free medical and lifestyle clinic at Penos Wolf St. George's on March 24th from 12 to 5 p.m. Let's look at what is happening in the upcoming week at Hamilton. Every Wednesday, dinner is served from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the community center. Happy Seniors Club every Tuesday in the center from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Come and fellowship. Come on out on Wednesday night for prayer meeting here in the sanctuary at 6.30 to 7.30. Bring your family, friends and co-workers and join us for a spirit-filled hour, everyone is welcome to attend. Now let's look at the upcoming events. On March the 16th from 9.15 to 10.45 a.m. there will be a Sabbath school lesson study in the sanctuary. Please come out and be enriched by the word. The men's ministry department is inviting all men to bowling night on March the 16th, please RSVP with any member of the men's ministry. You are all invited to a social hosted by the Hamilton Social Committee on Saturday, March 9 from 7 p.m. to midnight at the Hamilton SDA Youth Center. Hope to see you there. Now, let's celebrate all the birthdays for today and the upcoming week. We have a number of Sabbath birthday. Happy birthday to Lois, Schifferow, Terence Walden, Lovell Herbert, Marissa Rogers. Happy birthday to Berylyn Rogers, Eugene Eversley, who celebrate their birthdays on March the 10th. Damon DeGraff, Devin Rogers, Taboka Chigwande celebrate their birthday on March the 11th. Happy birthday! On March the 12th, Jamie Sedenio Jr., Maximilian Sterling, Patricia Lynn Dyer, 
Kameta Hendrickson and Diary Coddington celebrate their birthdays. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to Charles Trott, Dennis Warren, Tawana Tonic, Myla Birch, who celebrate on March the 13th. Happy birthday to Juliette Dillis and Tiffany Nathan, who celebrate on March the 14th. Happy birthday to Sonia Astwood, Kadar LeShaw Brown, Shonarika Sams, Ruth Holden, who celebrate on March the 15th. Moving on to wedding anniversaries, let's see who will be celebrating their wedding anniversary this week. Wishing a wonderful anniversary to Kim and Gina Aswood on March the 14th. Church family, these are the announcements for today. As we reflect on God's blessings, let's continue to rest in Him as He invites us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Have a wonderful spirit-filled worship experience at Hamilton Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. Happy Sabbath. Blessings, family and friends. Pastor Toll here. On behalf of our wonderful membership here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bermuda, we are grateful for your presence and participation in today's Lagos University. I pray you have been deeply blessed by the exploration of God's Word during this time. You see, engaging in such interactions like our Sabbath school lesson allows us to draw closer to Jesus. As a congregation, our ultimate goal is to help each individual enter into an intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sharing a changed life that radiates His love to the world. And so it is truly an experience like no other as we prepare for the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In light of this, I would like to offer our assistance in serving you better. If you require more information about Logos University, please feel free to contact us by texting the number, as you see on the screen, 441-517-5810. If you need prayer support, please send your prayer request to, as you see on the screen, intercessorsbda at gmail.com. Rest assured, someone will fervently be praying for you. We also invite you to join our weekly prayer meeting service every Wednesday at 6.30 in the evening, where we will dedicate time to pray for your requests, either publicly or privately. Moreover, if you have the opportunity, we will be delighted to meet you in person. Our church is located at 43 King Street, Hamilton, on the beautiful island of Bermuda. And so join us for a vibrant Sabbath school experience every Saturday, Sabbath morning at 9.15 a.m., suitable for all ages, followed by a God-centered worship service at 11 o'clock a.m. 
Although virtual worship has its merits, being physically present in our church adds an immeasurable depth to the experience. And so lastly, if you would like to find out more about our church family, engage in fellowship, or provide words of encouragement or support through donations, please email us, as you see on the screen, at hamiltonsda at gmail.com. Or you can even call us at 441-292-4276. Or you can visit our website at www.hamiltonsda.org. We eagerly look forward to hearing from you. Until we connect again, may God's presence not only dwell with you, but also within you. Guiding and blessing.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. No, 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 no. Let's let let's do this again. Good mo good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Now that's sounding good, like you, you like you, you you had breakfast this morning. That's good. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this our worship service today. We are, as we say at, here at Hamilton, where worship is a joy and the love is real. Won't you join me by standing for the call to worship? Our call to worship passage this morning is from Psalm 100. You may read with me. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. The church is now called to worship, who enter into his blessed love today. Thank you. Good morning, church family. Now you all know that I work for an emergency service right next door. And in our service, the service that we provide, we have what is called a dispatch center, where calls are received from the public who are in need of help. Now we can handle one call, we can have in, handle even multiple calls all at the same time. But dare I say, if we receive calls from the entire populace of Bermuda, it would overwhelm our system. We wouldn't be able to handle it. We wouldn't be able to dispatch the necessary resources to render care. But I'm so glad that there's another emergency service pastor that resides in heaven, that no matter the amount of calls it receives, 
it can handle it all at the same time. You see, his resources are not limited like ours. That is Jesus Christ. And as we have varying differences and needs, Jesus is ready to receive each and every call from us today. So I want to encourage us, if you have a need, it might be emotional need, it might be a physical need, it might be a spiritual need, that if you want to press forward this morning and send up a prayer request as our prayer team prepares our hearts and our minds to enter into this state of prayer, if you want to come forward this morning, rest assured, your prayer will be answered. Heavenly Father, we have come, we have assembled in your holy tabernacle. First, Lord, I ask that you would examine me as I pray on behalf of your children, that if there is anything that would hinder this prayer being answered, that you will forgive me of any wrongdoing or any wrong sin, any sin that you will hear this cry, O Lord. The Bible says, before we call, you will answer. And while we are yet speaking, you will hear. Lord, we come with our issues. We come with our problems. We come with our thanks. Lord, you have heard the cries of your people. How long, Lord? How long? I ask that you would answer according to your will. There's a lot of sickness in the land. We pray for Sister Sterling's grandson, Lord, that you would go by and although you have already answered prayer for them, I pray that you will continue to be with that family. Be with the doctors, the nurses, all those that administer health on your behalf, Lord, that you would render the care that is needed. Be with our marriages, Lord. The devil is on a front attacking the home. He does not want to see us to be uh, uh, in a winning circle, Lord. But break the chains that, that hinder us. 
Break the hurt, Lord. Break the strife. Heal this church. Heal your people. We will be sure to give you the honor and the glory. There are people who are suffering in silence. There are people who are in need of employment. Be the God that you have promised you will be. We are simple flesh. We are simple burn and blood. But I ask that you will cover us with your blood. Help us to stand on the principles of right, Lord. Be with the government of the day as they make policies and, and rules that govern this nation. That you will be the voice of reason in the room. And Lord, please be with our school. Be with the administration, the teachers, the faculty, the students, Lord. For it is your school. Protect it from the enemy. Protect our children's innocence, Lord. God, we call on you. Not in form or fashion. But we in a, in a time of need. And Lord, I ask that you will be with Pastor Toll as he shepherds this tiny flock of yours in this corner of your vineyard. Give him the wisdom beyond years, Lord. Be with his wife and his family. Be with all the leaders of this congregation. Help us to live rightly and do by, right by you. The word that is spoken today, we know it comes from you. So I ask that you would go about each person and plant the seeds that you have called to be spoken today, that we will receive it. But not only receive it, that we will walk in your principles. Now, Lord, I ask one more request, just one, that you will save us, Lord, above all things, save us when you return. Please, I ask that we will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and not the words of, depart from me, for I never knew you, Lord. Please. I beg on our behalf, hear this prayer, not because we're worthy, not because anything we've done right, but simply because we ask in the name of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and it's because of him crucified that we can stand and say, we are Christians, Lord. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Let the church say amen.
opening hymn, hymn number 522, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Okay, now you can hear me. Happy Sabbath. We have come today to celebrate and embrace the omnipresence of God that is aptly described in Matthew 25, verse 35. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. We have opened the doors of the church using God's example, and we are inviting in our guests, we're inviting in those that are sitting in on social media platforms watching us and looking for inspiration and looking for a sense of hope. We are here, the church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. We want to welcome those that are within our midst, our guests. If you're here, please stand so I can say hello. And the last time I stood here, nobody stood, and I'm going to start getting taking this personally, okay? 
There are two lovely people down in the corner here. And we're gonna pass you a mic. Oh, and there's someone else. Okay, I'm feeling much better, feeling better, okay. And we just want to know who you are, where you've come from, and I pray that you have an absolutely wonderful service with us today. Happy Sabbath. I'm John, and my sister Tina's here with me. We are on the Norwegian cruise ship today, and this was our day to be on Bermuda, so we wanted to share Sabbath experience here with you good folks. Thank you. Thank you. We're from, we're from um, Massachusetts and Maine. Welcome to Hamilton Church. Good morning, church. I'm Eudelyn Wright White, and I'm from sunny Jamaica. So I'm glad to be worshiping with you today, and I'm surprising the Dixons. That's lovely. Welcome to our church. Have a blessed Sabbath. Let the church of God again say amen. Amen, amen. amen. We want to thank uh, Sister Andrea Brown Harris for that warm welcome. Amen. amen. This truly is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Why don't you give God some praise? Amen. Amen. Today, a wonderful and a beautiful Sabbath day. And it's so good once again to see uh, each and every one of you on this uh, Sabbath. Uh, just uh, very quickly before we go into our fellowship time, uh, I would just would like to bring to your attention just a couple of uh, items as our dear clerk, uh, Sister Ned Eve, is going to join me at this time, especially for the final reading uh, of a special couple here today. Thank you, Sister Ned. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Trying to do two and three things at once. So we do have final reading for transfer of membership for two persons, finally. <laughs> and they are Malachi Omolo and Burial Awar, who are transferring from the Sports View Seventh-day Adventist Church in Nairobi, Kenya, to the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Hamilton, Bermuda. Amen, amen. J just in case you did not know who this special couple is, we're going to invite you to please stand. Please stand. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. And so it has been moved. Is there a second out there? Is there a second? Uh, all in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? It is carried. Someone ought to say amen. And so welcome officially. As members of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, we praise God for both your ministries and look forward to how God will continue to use you uh, going forward. Amen, church family? Amen, amen. Beautiful, wonderful. I would like to just uh, remind everyone, remind everyone that this evening, this evening at 6.30, we will have our family meeting. We call it a family meeting. Our family meeting will take place at 6.30 this evening. What I would like for you to do is, is just come a little bit early. We'll close off the Sabbath together, about 10 minutes, about 6.20. Uh, close off the Sabbath, and then we'll begin our business at 6.30. It is a family meeting uh, uh, that is... Uh, uh, draped in business. Amen. I see our treasure out there as we will be considering uh, not just some of the things in reference to this church, but of course, especially uh, our budget for 2024. And so we invite each and every one of you to join us. Uh, the little change in reference to usually what we would do is we will have a nice AY and then we'll go straight into the family meeting. But uh, there has been a change of uh, venue for AY. I was told this morning uh, as the Southampton Church has requested uh, Hamilton to join them for a special AY program. Uh, but we're going to invite those who may be supporting to run back to Hamilton to make 630. Is that all right? We need you in the place. We need you in the place so that we can continue uh, to do the work of the church here uh, at Hamilton Church. And so we invite you to come back uh, after 
uh, AY and so that you can join us so that we can complete uh, the work that God will have us to do in reference to uh, some of the items uh, that we want to uh, have in Hamilton. Because I, I, I know there's a number of things going on, and I say this because I really want you all to please attend. Is that all right? Is please attend. So all those who will be attending tonight, please raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me see your hand. Amen. Amen. I've got pictures, pictures, pictures. I got them out there. I got them out there. I got you all. All right. All right. So good. We look forward to seeing you at 6.30 uh, this evening as we uh, consider our uh, family uh, meeting. Uh, we also would just like to let you all know that even tonight, uh, so what you can actually do is you can even come if you so desire. You can come and uh, close uh, as we uh, pray together. We also, as a church family, we play together. Amen? And so there will be a social at the, uh, over next door uh, at 7. And so it will segue right into our, uh, after we finish, hopefully we finish in a timely manner so that you just send the children over. That's what we'll do. Just send the children over, Tracy. No, they have no excuse, but I want to be there also. And, and so I'm going to come in my, as a, as a right if I come in the business meeting with a pair of jeans and a shirt, is that all right, you all? Is that all right? All right. <laughs> but we invite you, you know, of course, of course, we're going to have some fun together uh, immediately after the uh, uh, business meeting. And so that's social seven o'clock. Remind you that there is daylight saving time uh, that uh, will come into effect. Uh, this uh, in the morning. And so what do we do? We spring forward. Amen. And so we're going to, uh, amen. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. I heard fall, spring forward, fall back. I learned that in elementary school. Oh, all right. Amen. So we'll remind you to set your clocks in reference to what takes place tomorrow. Amen. Uh, also, just a couple of things in reference to what will be happening in the month of March here at uh, Hamilton Church. Next week, we praise God, our youth department is taking over the service. Amen. Our first youth day of 2024. Someone ought to say amen. Youth <laughs> Emphasis Day. Amen. And so we praise God for Sister Keisha Dixon and her team. Uh, I'm just going to ask just very quickly, the youth department leaders, just stand. We, we praise God for our youth department. AY is doing an excellent job, y'all. All of our youth, all those who are part of the committee, member or none, you are voted. Stand up, please. All those youth leaders, amen. Amen. This is an excellent team, y'all. We praise God for our youth department. They're doing an excellent job. Excellent job here. I mean, AY is just unbelievable here at Hamilton Church. We praise God for our young people that are participating. And so we as a church family, we support our young people. Amen. We support our young people. They are the church of today and tomorrow. And so we want to invite you to support them next week's Sabbath. Uh, you know, this is God's church. God's church was started with young people. Amen. This church was started with young people. And so we praise God uh, for the training that is going to be taking place as they minister on behalf. And then the following Sabbath, guess what, you all? The following Sabbath is then Bermuda Institute Day. So the 23rd will be Bermuda Institute Day. So, it's, so we've got young people two weeks in a row. Ain't that awesome? Ain't that awesome? And then we will conclude with our communion service. Don't miss communion on March 30th. On March 30th, we want to remember our communion. We promise to have a wonderful time in the Lord, even as we're making preparations uh, during this time uh, so that it can be a blessing. And as mentioned in my message last week, Sabbath, as communion is not just uh, uh, regarding our vertical relationship with God, but as a horizontal relationship with each other. Amen. And so we'll have our uh, agape feast in the center immediately after the service. We're planning on finishing at one o'clock and then we're going to move into the center and we're going to have an enjoy some time of fellowship. Amen. As we together. And so we invite you to please uh, join us there. Uh, I'm, I was given, uh, I thought it was, I thought it was someone passing a, a message to me. I got a little worried just now, Sister Emmett. <laughs> but it is just an announcement in reference to the lifestyle, and uh, she is the clerk, so she wouldn't know. She wouldn't know. Turn to, absolutely. Medical and Lifestyle Clinic. Uh, this it will take place at Penno's Wharf in St. George's. Uh, there will be a number of health assessments, and this will be on Sunday, March 24th from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. And so there are flyers uh, that our ushers uh, have for you if you, when you leave here this uh, uh, afternoon. Uh, you can make sure you have that information for the 24th of March. Now, I'm told there are a number of individuals who have birthdays today, amen? And so we praise God for uh, one special person now. We know that there's a uh, Louis Schifferor. 
Lewis, Lewis Schifferor. She may be watching by way of online. And so, oh, she's here. Oh, she is here, amen. Why don't you please stand, Mr. Schifferor, amen. She is, I was given permission because you gave it out. She, she let you all know she's 86 years old, amen. And so happy 86th birthday, amen. We love you, God blessings upon you, amen. Amen, amen. We praise God for you and may God uh, continue to continue to keep you uh, prosper and be in health just as your soul prospers. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, we also have uh, Terrence Weldon. Terrence Weldon is birthday today. I don't know. It's Ta Terrence Weldon. Let's give Terrence a round of applause. He may be watching by way of online. We, we also have Lovell uh, Herbert. Lovell Herbert. Lovell Herbert, so we want to congratulate him. Happy birthday to you also. And then we have Marissa Rogers. Marissa Rogers. On, is this French? She's, the, she's away enjoying her birthday. Amen. If she's watching with her husband, we want to say, your fam, church family, we want to say happy birthday to you. May God continue to bless you. We love you. And enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Amen. 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 At this time, family, let's uh, stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. This is now our fellowship time. Uh, we're so glad that we're all in the house of the Lord today. I'm glad to have my uh, youngest daughter back for a little bit, uh, for a week. Amen. Soraya, welcome. Uh, but we're so glad that all is well in the house. We would like you to take this moment as our praise team is going to lead us in our welcome song. But take a moment, uh, touch your neighbor, give them a hug, and tell them you love them. Amen. God bless you.
Put your spirit in the world. Put your joy within. Your joy within. Let my going out. And by coming in. Put your spirit in the world. And your joy. And your joy within. Invite the children to come forward at this time for children's worship. Children in worship. Get your flags ready. Get your flag. Find a flag. If it's your hand, a handkerchief, a purse. Love is a flag for Your flag up. Come on, so come on. So let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. So let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know. That the king is a resident. Say joy. Joy is a flag on high from the castle of my heart. From the castle of my heart. of you love to cook? Yes? How many of you love to bake? Yes. All right. What are some of the things that you can bake? Make? Cupcakes. Cupcakes. Taylor? Cake. Cake? Cake. 
cake. It seems like we have a lot of bakers. Donuts. Donuts. I haven't I haven't mastered donuts yet. Banana bread. Banana bread, Mercy. All right. Absis, do you bake or cook anything? Yes, what do you cook? Waffles. Waffles. Fried egg. Oh, a fried egg. Well, good. Moving on. All right. Popcorn. Popcorn. Bacon. All right. I can make rice. Yes? Rice. Rice. Okay, Noah. One more, Absis. Mr. Suso. Uh, <laughs> pancakes. Uh, Do you make pancakes with Carter sometimes? No. No? Waffles? They, ma they make popcorn. Oh, popcorn. All right, Absis. Thank you. Camille, tell me real quick. Sunny side up. All right. Brownies. One more. Okay. Thank you. So I have. I have someone in my family who loves to cook, other than me. My husband loves to cook, but also I have a son who loves to cook. How many of you have ever tasted anything that he has made before? All right, sometimes he can little rip up a little pasta. He likes a little pasta. He's graduated from that, and then he'll like take some salmon and put some seasoning on it, and he'll hook it up. It's pretty good, right? One thing that Caden has gotten into lately, can anyone guess? But well, in cooking, he always does this. Drying or cooking? No. Peanut butter. No. Wash your hands. Well, yes, he does wash his hands. <laughs> but he likes, he is into sauces, like making sauces. Oh. So he says, oh, I think this will be, you could put a nice sauce on this or a nice sauce on that, right? Now, me, who do, I don't like dry food, right? We work well together because he makes a good sauce. Now, he makes this sauce, you guys. Now, this sauce, you can put it on french fries. My mouth is watering. He puts it on french fries, okay? But guess what? That, that sauce is so good, right, Rhea? What, what do I put it on to? Can you guess? What else I put it on, kid? And talk to me. I know. I know. Pasta. I, yeah, I could put it on there too, but I don't usually. What do I put it on? Never mind. <laughs> Tell me, Kaden. Rice. I put it on rice. I mix that bad boy up. Oh, it's delicious, right? <laughs> Kaden loves a sauce, so he's into doing that. But he always, but like for us, we say this sauce is perfect. But he says, no, 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 mommy, it needs, it's missing something. It's always something missing for Kaden. He's always looking for that secret ingredient, right? We were talking, and we said, that's kind of like the Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit in our life. That missing ingredient sometimes, we may feel like we have it all together, but the Holy Spirit is kind of gives us that extra zhuzh, right? That zest. So there are some things that the Holy Spirit does for us. So one thing that the Holy Spirit does for us, Caden, is what? Guides us. Guides us. What else does he do? He gives us spiritual gifts. So he gives us spiritual gifts. Some of you have the gift of helps. Do you know what that means? That means you, you, look, at some, you look at someone and you see a need and you are good at just helping. One person I know who's good at that is Rhea. Not, she, the minute she sees somebody needs help, she'll come over and she'll say, you need a hug today? Or she'll say, let me, let me help you take your bag. Or look like you're doing a bit much, auntie. Let me help you out, right? And she's, oh, Taylor says she's the class therapist. She, I agree, I agree. <laughs> All right, so, yes, okay. So another thing, <laughs> another thing is this Holy Spirit comforts us, okay? There are times when we feel like there's nobody else that can comfort us, and we're just like, leave me alone. I don't talk to anybody else, but then, God sends the comforter, God sends someone or this Holy Spirit that's just going to embrace us. There are some scripture texts that he gives us, Vali and Amir. There are some scripture texts that he may say, listen, remember, God is always with you. God's got it, right? So the Holy Spirit comforts us. He also does what? Let's see who else can read this. Read this for me, please. Comfort. Convict. Convict us of our sins. All right, thank you, Samay. Convicts us of our sins. There, sometimes when we know we shouldn't be talking in class, you know full well, Mr. Dixon, say it, do your work, right? Okay, he says, guys, I need you to be quiet. I just need it quiet. But you know that you just have to tell your friend that one little thing. I just got to say it. I got to say it in the middle of what he's saying, right? And the Holy Spirit said, don't do it. It's not going to end well for you. 
And then most times it was. Don't end well, right, Candy? Don't end well. All right. So the Holy Spirit is that extra seasoning, that extra little piece, that magic that we need in our lives. And we have to acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us. Okay? I want you to always remember that you can't do anything without God and his spirit that's guiding you. Agreed? All right. That's the secret sauce that I'm going to share with you today. Caden has a text that he's going to read. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, so that we, that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. All right, thank you very much, Caden. I would like for one person to come. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to always be with us. Okay? Do the plan. Do the plan. Plan is not enough. Just one more time. Everyone's eyes closed. Dear Jesus, please help us for for every. Please help everyone who have lost their children. Help the people who are sick. Please help people who lost their loved ones. Please help people who, who... Please help the people with the Holy Spirit and of God. Please help people who need to learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, take that secret sauce back with you to your seat. Good afternoon, church. Good morning. So now is the time in our service where we can all participate uh, as we return to God, our tithes, and our offering. Before we do that, I wanted to bring something to our remembrance. Uh, if you would retrieve a hymn book in front of you and turn to hymn number 572, hymn number 572, you would see a favorite hymn of mine. So I thought I would use this this morning as the basis for our giving. Pastor, what's that hymn called? Give of your best to the master. All of these hymns have a story behind them. I'd just like to share a little bit with you. The writer of this hymn is who, Elder Old Boy? Howard Gross. He wrote this text for this hymn in 1901, and of him it could never be said that he gave God second best or only the leftover parts of his life. He gave the best to Jesus. Here we go, just his curriculum vitae. He was an ordained Baptist pastor, served several churches, was the president of the University of South Dakota, taught at the University of Chicago, was the assistant editor of a newspaper in Boston on the move, was the editorial secretary of the American Baptist Home Mission Society, and he edited 
many missions journals. And so we have in Brother Gross, an individual who loved Jesus so much that he gave him his best. Well, that's analogous to what we do right at this point in our service. And it must have been the same spirit that propelled and compelled Brother Gross that propelled Sister White, because she writes to us in the book, Acts of the Apostles, pages 339, these words. In regards to giving, she says, the spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. This spirit finds its highest manifestation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In our behalf, the Father gave his only begotten Son, and Christ, having given up all that he had had, then gave himself that man might be saved. She goes on to say, the cross of Calvary should appeal to the benevolence of every follower of the Savior. The principle there illustrated is to give, give. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk as our Savior walked. Amen? On the other hand, saints, listen now. On the other hand, the spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. The principle illustrated in the lives of worldlings is to get, get. Thus, they hope to secure happiness and ease. But the fruit of their sowings is misery and death. And then she finishes up by saying these words, not until God ceases to bless his children will they cease to be under bonds to return to him the portion that he claims. Not only should they render the Lord the portion that belongs to him, but guess what, Onesimus? They should also bring to his treasury a gratitude of offering, a liberal tribute. With joyful hearts, they should dedicate to the creator the first fruits of their bounties, their choicest possessions, their best and holiest service. Thus, they will gain rich blessings. God himself will make their souls like a watered garden whose waters never fail. And when the last great harvest is gathered in, the sheaves that they are enabled to bring to the master will be the recompense of their unselfish use of their talents and their treasure lent to him. Amen? Amen. So let us ponder on these thoughts uh, and let it affect us where we are to give unto God our best. Will the deaconesses and deacons now stand to receive God's tithe and offering? Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for another opportunity to collaborate with you in your work of saving souls. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we give, our own souls will be refreshed, that you would free us from the deceptions and illusions of the enemy. Lord, and create in us a clean heart and a right spirit, one that is willing to give sacrificially as you command. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
segment of the service. I know we've been praising and worshiping all along, but now it's officially praise and worship segment. All right, so you can just let loose now in Jesus' name. I want to publicly thank this group of Levites. Every now and then when it's praise team two times, second Sabbath, I put it out there, I have a little pool. They have a little pool on WhatsApp. Who's available for second Sabbath? Well, I only got one response, and then that one person, unfortunately, wasn't able to make it. But I just want to thank God for each and every one of these singers that came through at the last minute. Rams in the thicket. Thank you, Jesus, for every one of you. I want to publicly thank you for lending, lending your voice last minute for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. This song is familiar. You know it. It's for God's glory that we would do anything. It's for God's glory that we would cross the hottest desert. We would climb the highest mountain. Come on. You, <laughs> so for God's glory, we pray that you'll be blessed. Please sing along with us. Worship with us. Because we serve an awesome God. Amen. Okay.
I just have to take this opportunity and share a brief testimony. I promise God that the next time I have my hand on a mic and to publicly, publicly thank him for what he did for me about a month ago, I caught the flu really bad, 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 worst flu ever. And I had some excessive coughing. The term is rectus sheath hematoma. It's an uncommon cause that caused me some very acute abdominal pain and violent the other thing, right? So there I was being raised to the hospital in the ambulance. My daughter, nurse Zaria to be in Jesus' name, called the ambulance and said, Mama, that's it. Put your clothes on. You're going. You're going. You're going to hospital. I'm okay. Sorry. I'm okay. I'm okay. And um, she, took, she took charge and went to the ER room and and at the end of the day, I ended up spending five days in the hospital with some compression treatment. I coughed so much, I busted a blood vessel. And the blood was pooling underneath the muscle there. And so they had to do something called compression treatment to stop the blood vessel from bleeding out. And I had to lay on my back, literally, for a few days. So at first, they were going to send me home. And he goes, you know what? You're not going to lay on your bed. I'm like, yes, I am. I am. I'm going to do it. So they said, no, we're going to admit you. So I got admitted. Five days, um, Pastor Tall came and see me and other people and the elders. I just want to thank you for all of you that showed me love and came and visited me. My brother, thank you very much. But at the end of the day, through all of that, you know when you do... I'm sorry? Uh, my sister, sorry. Oh my gosh. You saw the face? Did you see the face? Like, hi. Yes. <laughs> my brother and my sister <laughs> came to visit me. Thank you, Michelle and Michael. I appreciate you. That's family love right there, family love, family love. And at the end of the day, you know when they do their testing at the beginning when you come in, your blood tests and all those things, what they found was my blood levels were off the charts. They did an A and one C, I think that's the terminology. Thank you, A one C. And they could see what your blood level was for the past, the previous three months. Well, it was completely off the charts. So they had to immediately start me on insulin, et cetera, and all those things. And I was clueless. I felt fine. And that's what the doctor says. Yeah, you do feel fine until you drop dead of a stroke or a heart attack. It's a very silent killer. So whilst in, on the, in the hospital for those five days, I thought God was sending me there to fix the blood vessel that's bleeding out. 
Well, he sent me to save me from something else. So while I thought I was going for one thing, God saved me from another. Lord is good. He's been so good to me. And I just don't have enough time to tell it all, but I just knew today that I would use today to just say, thank you, Lord. Lord, you've been good. You've been so good. It's been so good to me. Better than I've been to myself. And I, I can't praise him enough. Even if I tried, because he's been so good to me. If that's your testimony this morning, while we sing this song, raise your hands and give God's praise because he is worthy of all the praise. And sing this song along with us today. Lord, you are so good. Good 
to me. You've been better than good to me. Come on. You've been better than good to me. You've been better than good to me. Oh, say, you've been better than good to me. Say that. So good, say you in the midnight hour. So good, oh, say you've been God when I'm laid on my back. Oh, God, say, Lord, you've been so good. One last time, say. Everybody grateful. Hallelujah. God is so good. Oh, you know this one. Say God. God is so good. Oh, yes, he is. Say God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. He's so good. I want to thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good. Oh, God is so good to me. Yeah. Even when I don't deserve it. He's so good. He's so good to point to yourself and say, Me. Me. Hallelujah. Give God the praise this morning. Give God the praise this morning. He's worthy. Yes, he is. Thank you, Jesus. Someone ought to again say amen. God is too good. Oh, mercy. Thank you. Thank you. So good to me. Thank you, praise team, for leading us uh, to the throne room of God here at this time. I invite you to uh, please uh, pray with me as we hear from the Lord. Father God, thank you. Thank you for sending your son. You are so good. God, we ask that your blessing will be upon us as we hear your word right now. That your goodness, Lord God, will be revealed through this message. And that as we leave this place, we can say again, God has been so good to me. Bless your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've titled what would be sort of like a theological message here today, The Faith of Jesus. It's no uh, title in reference to myself, but as you all would be well aware that uh, this phrase describes God's people at the end of time. The Revel book of Revelation is a very important book, as we all know here today. God has raised up a people who proclaim a special message during a special time. But as I consider Revelation, I want to remind us that it's not just Revelation, it says Revelation of Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals Jesus and this wonderful book God has given to his people. In Revelation 1, 3, it, it reads, Blessed <laughs> is he who reads those who hear and those who keep the things written in it, for the time is at hand. So consider every time you read, every time you hear, every time you keep, it's a blessing. Consider yourself, someone ought to say, I am blessed. I am blessed. As is our sort of custom here, I invite you as we consider God's word here today for you to stand with me and read with me on the screen just one verse, just one verse, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation 14, verse 12. I invite you to read along with me. And it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. This very important verse reveals a very important issue uh, during the end of time. Of course, this verse is written in a specific context, and it shows up in relation to the everlasting gospel. Recorded in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. And we know this to be summarized in the three angels' message. In Revelation chapter 14, 6, it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach upon them who dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Don't be mistaken, this message involves the whole world. And this first angel, in the context of what we're looking at today, it says, fear God, as you see there, the announcement is to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. There's then a, and a second announcement regarding uh, Babylon fallen, speaking of the apostate religious political system. It says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen at that great city because she made not some nations, but all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then there's a third angel, there's a third angel, and there's a warning not to worship the beast and not to receive its mark. And it says, it's a warning, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall unfortunately drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Any saints here today? And he's saying here today. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. Here's the, you're going to need patience. Endurance. A lot's going to be going on. A lot is going on. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so the faith of Jesus is found in the context, it's important, well, I'm dealing with, in the context of the everlasting gospel. It is not in addition to the everlasting gospel, it is actually a part of the everlasting gospel. I'll come out and say it, it, it is the everlasting gospel that actually produces a people known as saints who keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus. And so the obvious question is, very quickly, what is the faith 
of Jesus. Because the reality is there is a difference between faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. This is very important as we are going through a process, as we are entering into, uh, as we have entered into a very critical time in earth's history. And, and God wants to make sure that his people endure. He wants to make sure his people have faith. And the difference between faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus, when we exercise faith in Jesus, we would then live, we would then live it out in our lives, the faith of Jesus. So in other words, the faith comes from Jesus. It's Jesus' faith. We looked at last week uh, as we considered the fruit of the Spirit or the Spirit. It's actually the Spirit's faith. In order to actually have faith, we need the Spirit. You heard the children's story today. We needed help. Amen. The reality is we ourselves could do nothing. And so what is faith? Very quickly, faith, first of all, what is faith? Now, we know the Bible lets us know in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says faith, faith in what you believe about Jesus, faith in Jesus' word, belief in Jesus. But it says hope. Hope to hope something to happen. There's a great expectation. There's an outcome. Some of us, we hope we can, uh, the doctor can make us better. Some of us hope the country will calm down. Some of us hope we can buy that house. We, we hope that we can finish school. We, we hope that we can get married. Some of us hope we can lose some weight. There's also the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it now, but you have a conviction that is going to happen. Stay with me. It's based off of God's word, and sometimes there's our lack of faith that doesn't allow God to do the work that he wants to do in us. We should stop looking all the time of what we see and, and start looking for and hoping for what was promised in the victory of Jesus. Because the reality is in Hebrews eleven six 6, it continues after one, it says, but without faith, because without faith, it is actually impossible to please him. Does anybody want to please God here today? Yes. Today he wants to exercise faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith connects us with what sight even can see. To depend upon our five senses is not to have faith. That's evidence of what you can see. But God has a work in you right now, and you may not be able to see it right now, but this is why he says, I want you to have faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says, for by grace, for example, you have been saved through what? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. <laughs> Some think good works will save them, but it's not works that save them, but it's God's love through the blood of Jesus Christ, we leave through his grace. The reality is the reason why people will be lost in the end is because they did not accept the free gift given to us by God. The gospel's very simple. It's justification. But as we continue this theme, as we clearly try to understand what is going on in the last scenes of in Earth's history, God is desiring true heart worship. This is why he says in reference to faith, he says, I want you to do Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you, someone say, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That takes faith. He says, I want the people to be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? I want to say, don't beat yourself up. May, you may not see, uh, see it right now, uh, uh, but, but you got to know that it's going to happen. You're going to have to have some confidence. Know, you, you know what I'm right now, Lord, but I know what God is making me to be. Being confident. I like the very book, uh, The Sanctuary Service, M. L. Andreessen. He describes this process even of salvation, this faith experience, and this uh, in its correlation with 
uh, justification and sanctification. How many of you have been stranded on a ship or a boat, left out to sea, the engine stopped working? It's never happened to you? <laughs> I see a couple of hands. I see a couple of hands. I see the hands in the back. How are you when help comes? You, you're, you're happy and you're excited, correct? You're safe because you're not stranded. But you know they say, are you safe and sound? The reality is, he says, he gives an illustration in reference to this, as a disabled ship towed to port is safe but not sound, so the man is saved but not sound. Repairs need to be made on the ship before it is pronounced seaworthy. And the man needs reconstruction before he is fully restored. This process of restoration is called sanctification and includes in its finished product body, soul, and spirit. Listen, when the work is finished, the man is wholly, completely sanctified and restored to the image of God. It is for this demonstration of what the gospel can do for man that the world is looking for. The reality is God wants us to know something. When he died on the cross, he wants you to know that, hey, I have what? Begun a good work. You're safe. <laughs> But there's a process of sanctification to make us sound. And he wants us to say, he said, don't get discouraged where you are right now. He says, believe, be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it. That's the promise. That's the promise of God. Do we believe it? We may not see it. You gotta believe it. That's faith. How does this happen? Even this sanctification process. Galatians 2:20, as we're in this name of the Holy Spirit and preparing for God, he says, I have been what? Crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's who living in me? It's Christ living in me. We talked about that last week of how Christ's work is actually Christ doing the living. And, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a very important theme. I'm safe, but how do I get signed? Christ in me, and the Holy Spirit begins to do this work of restoration in my life. For example, when Christ, even when he lived on this earth, did he keep God's commandments? Because we understand through even Revelation 12, 14, the, the commandments will become an issue. But Jesus says in John 15, 10, if you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as what? I, Jesus said, I've kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. And if Christ lives in you, you will, will he not cause us to keep his commandments if he's living in you? That's the key. It's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. I can't be doing the living. I can show you all. I can tell you all. If I'm living, if I, I'm going to mess this thing up. I have to be dead to Christ. But if Christ is living in me, we'll be able to do his great and perfect work. This is important in reference to as we consider, because you have this theme now, family. Something's happening. Because the reality is you realize that you have to take all confidence away from the flesh. And this is really the, end, the, is, the issue at the end of time. It's, it's no longer confidence in man, but it's full confidence in Jesus Christ. And this is why in Selected Messages, as we're talking to the church, she says in Selected Messages 172, the faith of Jesus, it is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the what message? The third angel's message is an important message. Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning savior. Jesus was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins, that we might take his righteousness. 
You see the great exchange? And faith, here we go, faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply, that means more than enough, and fully, that means completely, and entirely, that's holy. This is the faith of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's good news. You see, it, it, it always lies outside of ourselves. As soon as there is one iota of hope that I am saved through anything but the blood of Jesus, you're lost. There is only one hope to know I am saved amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus Christ. And the reality is this Sabbath theme comes up because that is the theme of actually the Sabbath. I'm going to get there. That's why I'm building right now. Just bear with me so you understand what the issue really is at the end of time. So these are review and arrows. says the thought that Christ, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, that means attributed to us or credited to us. It's something that we did not do. I want you to get the gospel is good news. The thought that Christ's righteousness, righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. That's why we can sing and say, God, he is so good. He is so good. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. Something happens when you realize, as the dirty scoundrel that you are, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Something happens when you recognize all that you have done. Everything that you've done wrong in your life, Jesus Christ loves you so much that he says, I save you. He does something happens, as, as we saw last week. The motive changes. He, he says, you love me before I, I could have done anything. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Something happens. Then the saying, I don't have to earn my way to salvation. The motive changes, but you have a desire then to keep his law, but you're still struggling because you need his Holy Spirit to actually do that work. But your motive has changed. So if he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. The simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. God's people must have that faith which will lay hold of divine power, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Those who believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven their sins should not, through temptation, fail to press on to the fight, the good fight of faith. Their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life, as well as their words, shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin, all sin, all sin. This is important, family, in reference to as we consider what Christ has already done for us in this theme. Because the reality is we as a people of God are going to need to study God's word more and more so it's in our hearts so that we can claim those wonderful promises that God has given us. As a matter of fact, the reality is the enemy wants to keep us away from the word because the word of God is actually, as we saw, even as the spirit of God, it would lead us into all truth. The spirit of God also tells us things to come. And so I always liken this situation in reference to God's Holy Spirit and when Christ is in us and now he's able to do a great and a wonderful work. Uh, I'm, I'm an avid fan. I love playing the game of Uno. And I, I, I love Uno uh, and I, I love playing with my friends. And, but with Uno, elders, uh, 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 pre-Christ, uh, 
I had a, a you know, little problem. I had a little problem. I, I would always look to see what was in the other person's hand. I, I would, you know, while they're talking and I would, you know, be saying something else and, you know, they're not paying attention and I would see they got a riot too. So I say, okay, well, let's skip over this person, you, you know, and then, then they're wondering, I remember praying with a friend and they're wondering how, how they keep getting skipped or it's as if someone knows their next hand. And they were angry until they found out someone was, I don't even like to say the word, this was pre-Christ, cheating. <laughs> Cheating, cheating, cheating. Pre-Christ, pre-Christ, pre-Christ. Uh, I'm good if you want to play Uno with me. The reality is the enemy is very angry because there's a group of people who knows his next move. They know what card's coming next. And he's doing everything that he possibly can to, to uh, attack them, to prevent them from actually having this uh, uh, God's word in their heart, from actually studying God's word so that they can know the things that are about to take place. As a matter of fact, you remember with this theme, faith, you want to have faith of Jesus, you must have faith in Jesus, and this is also in his word. There's a uh, fire pilots, uh, they've experienced a phenomenon called vertigo, uh, and it's described as a pilot who uh, his senses tell him that the aircraft is turning. But the, if he looks at his instruments, the instruments tell him that he's on the right path. And so what happens is the uh, pilot can do two things. He can trust in his senses that, that seem to say that, no, this is, this is turning the wrong way. And he can trust in his senses or he can trust in his instrument. If he trusts in his senses, he's going to turn when he actually should not. And he's going to find out that the plane's actually going to crash. But if he trusts in his instruments, if he trusts in his instruments, he'll be on the right path and he'll, have a, he'll land safely and soundly. What God has given us in his word is for us to not trust our senses. Don't trust your feelings, what you believe. He said, trust in the word of God. And it'll lead you to the path. And this is why Jesus can say in John 14, 23 to 24, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and, we'll, he, and we, will, we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So this is why we have to have that faith in God's word. No matter what. It may feel like you say, you know what, I'm going to trust in Jesus. And this is why these group of people at the end of time, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is in the context of the everlasting gospel, in the context of the third angel's message, which is a final message in do not receive the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast crisis reveals who really has faith. If you love me, keep my commandments. It reveals who we are. And during the Mark of the Beast crisis, the saints endure trial and, and tribulation because they have the faith of Jesus. You all realize it's going to take some real strong faith or the faith of Jesus to go through a crisis where you cannot buy or sell. That means you can't depend on your job. You're going to have to depend on this is what's going on. It's depending on God. It's depending on God, the faith of Jesus. As we see last week, this message, we see that it's love of God that leads us to repentance, to desire to be obedient. This system that comes up in the end of time, we begin to see there will be uh, obedience becomes the fruit of true faith. The Bible has to know by faith, able offered a better sacrifice than his brother Cain. There was the right motive was brought to front. And Cain, as we see, brought his best to God, but it was not what God actually required. I illustrate this, and we've done before in reference to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time, as you can tell, in, in uh, the Scoops ice cream store. Uh, and uh, my family, they love ice cream, and sometimes they will send me to, uh, to the ice cream store uh, to get some scoops. So, 
And uh, one day my wife sent me to the store. Uh, I made a rookie mistake. Uh, uh, she sent me to the store to get her some pralines and cream. Uh, she loves pralines and cream. I believe her favorite right now is Oreo. Uh, uh, but she sent me to, she, she makes her own ice cream now, I believe. Wow. Yeah, yeah, she does. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, what happened is uh, I got to the store and I saw these different flavors. They were very colorful and they were beautiful. And, and they looked very, very delicious. Uh, I even, you know, you go to the store and you taste it. You just try it out. And I say, this tasted good. It tasted, it tasted good to me. And, and so I decided to pivot. And I said, I, I believe my wife's going to like this ice cream. And so I, I, I went, came back home, and uh, I'm excited to present my wife uh, with this beautiful new uh, ice cream that I found. And uh, she was uh, looking forward to uh, pralines and cream. And, and she said, what is this? I said, this is a new type of ice cream. It's exciting. She said, uh, do you think my wife was happy with me when I came in? She, she, she was not. She, she, I, I, and why wasn't she happy? Because she asked for pralines and cream. I thought I gave my best to her. I thought I was doing a good deed. I thought that she would be excited because of what I did. But it was not what she asked for. The reason why Cain was rejected because it was not what God asked for. Both of them were worshiping. Cain was bringing the best of its fruits. But it was not by faith because that's not what God asked for. At the end of time, there will be two groups. Everybody, according to Revelation 13, will be worshiping. But the difference of the issue is who they worship and how they worship who they worship. The Bible lets us know that everybody, in some instance, at the end of time, will be Christian. This is why you have to be careful, young people. It's not just by claiming to be a Christian. Do you actually have Christ where you actually then do what he says? That comes as the fruits of obedience, the fruit of obedience. So, so this is what's happening. This is the worship because there's two types of worship in the end of time. You see it. And all the world wondered after the beast. And so you begin to understand what's going on in reference to this scene. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and truth. Those who worship God must worship God in spirit, Christ in them, but also at the same time, it's truth in God's word. Howbeit, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for she, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever you shall hear, he shall speak. And it will show you, what will the spirit do? The spirit will show you things to come. That's the work of the spirit. And so, so this is interesting now because we begin to see that God is trying to do a wonderful work of sanctifying his people. We're, we're safe, but we're not sound. And so he says in John 17, 17, sanctify or make them holy, them through thy truth. And what is truth? Thy word is truth. If you want to be sanctified, because yes, God has saved us through the blood of the Lamb, but in to be sanctified, to be now made sound, you have to be sanctified through the truth. I was going to sanctify, and this sanctification comes up. Wherever I have also gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who what? So hold on, we're getting to the issue at the end of time because most of us have been mistaken. Moreover, I have also given them my Sabbaths to be a what? A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. I'm going to make them holy. Hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And so we've looked at it before when we, God worship, worship him who made heaven and earth is, is the theme in reference to the everlasting gospel. We've seen that Sabbath keeping is not a means of salvation. It is a sign of salvation. It reminds us God is the one that's going to sanctify us and also make us holy. 
a sign, a mark. There's a sign and a mark of the beast. Cain persecuted Abel. The Sabbath issue will be the final test at the end of time. The event described will separate the true believer from the false believer. I'm going to clear something up because the majority of believers who will make it to heaven may have been Sunday keeping Christians while they were here on this earth. Stay with me. You know, the change gradually took place in 200, 300 AD. And it grew to most Christians kept Sunday until uh, this day today. They are our brothers and sisters who we love very much. Amen. There may be people who died keeping Sunday but loving Jesus. He knew them. Many are resting in Christ but did not even properly understand the Sabbath truth due to many things, traditions and teachings, some ministers. And that is why God was going to restore this truth at a specific time in Earth's history. And the Sabbath was to be restored. So remember that there are sincere Christians they did not even know about the Sabbath truth. And God holds us accountable for what we know. Uh, but we see many times in how we present sometimes this very sensitive uh, message. We present it in the sense of it's Sunday Christians versus Saturday Christians, or a us versus them. The majority of Christians are keeping Sunday even today. But if salvation is through faith alone, family, because of what Christ did 2,000 years ago, we have to realize what the Sunday and Sabbath issue really is. It's not an issue of Sunday Christians versus Sabbath Christians. Because when we understand the gospel and the great controversy, we begin to see clearly this issue. Remember, there will be many Sabbath keepers who will be lost. Because like the Pharisees of old, they keep the Sabbath day, but they don't keep Jesus. Jesus saves. And so even in, in early writings, <laughs> I think she's been mistaken so many times, early writings 85 to 86, she even says, I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between, between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. And that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with what? <laughs> at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. The commencement of that time of trouble here Mention does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. By the way, by the way, it's important for me to know with all that's going on right now, I believe we're very close to this time. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, Trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry. Are the nations angry? Yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. It's held in check. At that time, the latter rain, the what? Or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. God is preparing us right now to receive the latter rain. It's the Holy Spirit work. We're preparing to receive it preparing to receive it, because the reality is that the time is at hand, but God is holding things in check. Now, I was bombarded with a number of, number of messages yesterday, number of messages yesterday in reference to this new news that came out in reference to what uh, is going on in reference to the European Sunday Alliance. So 
or no? Uh, the universal Sunday law, as we know, as Seventh-day Adventists, will become the mark of the beast. Let me say it again. The universal Sunday law will become the mark of the beast. Nobody at present has the mark of the beast. It will become the mark of the beast. Right now, things are being held in check. That's why I see it as this U.S. election is a very important election. Because the U.S. will play a very major part in Revelation 13. And the language that is coming out of one specific political party and former president has me thinking Really, his family, God made a perfect world. Remember. And Satan snatched dominion from Adam and Eve, and since then he's become ruler of this world, the enemy. And the gospel is trying to restore God's kingdom. Uh, we will see Sunday in a world under Satan represents man's unfinished, perfect, imperfect work. Because the reality is, man need a break. And this is where this comes from, right? If you read it, the European Sunday Alliance issues a new manifesto promoting a work-free Sunday for all. The Catholic Church and the European Union, in view of the European Day for a work-free Sunday. So this is new. This is as a result of the last 10 days, I believe, it's come out. You see, the real issue is not really Sabbath-keeping Christians versus Sunday-keeping Christians. Yes, we disagree on which day, but one thing is clear. Both groups, some Christians, on the same platform in reference to Jesus as our Redeemer. And the issue is between the church against the world under Satan, highlighted at a certain time in Earth's history. And the hearts will be revealed with a final test. Who are truly God's? The reality is even right now, some of us know, the International Labor Union Day of Rest is already Sunday. So it has nothing to do clearly with God, it's rest from man's works. Most banks are closed on Sunday. It's rest from man's work. So begin to see a theme in reference to rest from man's work when the Sabbath is rest from God's work. And we saw already the first whole day of Adam and Eve's life. What did they, did they work? No, they rested. They didn't have to do any work. They rested, and then as a result of the rest, then they were able to do work. But Sabbath, from God's view, he worked, then rested. But Sabbath, from man's kind of view, is that we don't begin by working. We begin by resting, and then we work. Saved by faith through grace. And see, work is the fruits of righteousness of what Christ has already done. And so Sunday does not have a spiritual meaning, but as far as the world is concerned, Sunday is rest from man's work. And so the issue is between the world and the church, God's works versus man's works. And this major issue would not take place until the gospel is preached to the whole world in its fullness. So Sabbath, during the conflict, we clearly that it's a sign of the saved saints. The mark of the beast represents man's works, and the Sabbath is a sign that was saved by God's works. And so you begin to see the theological significance of Sabbath versus Sunday. So, great controversy. You can read this in your own time. I'm soon to be finished, and I know it's small, so you just listen to me. Great controversy 605, 606. Here to four. Those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control of the United States, the church and the state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become, talk about the United States, other than what it has been the defender of religious freedom. 
But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, there is an agitation, the event so long doubted, because many doubt because God's word is true, and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have done before. God is saying, family, be faithful to the message that God has entrusted you with. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. He says, be faithful, trust, have patience, saints. And so don't deviate from what has been entrusted, where it's been strategically set up to be a part so that this can take place. And so, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third angel's message will produce an effect which it could not have had done before. And as the controversy extends into new fields, even Bermuda, and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman effort to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. And the church... The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. And as the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes a more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against who? Commandment keepers. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment. Some will be offered positions of influence. 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 And other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under the similar circumstances. Those who are aligned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth and some who hear them are led, listen up though, listen to this, listen to this, and some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. So people will hear the testimony. Many of us will be in place in positions where the courts will end up hearing us. And because of our stance, because we understand the faith of Jesus and faith in Jesus and filled with the spirit of Jesus, because that's important also, many will take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. Light will be brought before thousands who otherwise know nothing of these truths. Family, God's calling a people to stand true to him during this last crisis. And the reality is, in the individuals, as the Bible says, here is, we're going to call for patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have the faith of Jesus. So it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. See, this is where you place your emotions in the Lord. If your thinking is right, your feelings will be right. This is why right theology builds right practice. And God's calling us to walk by faith and not by sight. Trust him even when you can't trace him. When you don't see what he's even talking about sometimes, he says, trust in me because God sees, someone has said, God sees behind corners. You see, faith is not being able to see, but, but trusting the one who can see, and that's Jesus. And the reason why sometimes we're not experiencing the growth, the reason why it is not expressed because our faith does not go beyond our sight. God wants us to step out in faith. Yes, it's going to get tough, family. 
As a matter of fact, 1 Peter 4, 12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. This is all part of God's process. And he wants to say, he says, never, ever, ever give up on my word. Trust me, trust me. James 1, 2 to 3 says, consider it pure joy, brothers, when, whenever you face trials of, of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. And so some of us may be going through something right now as we begin to close. Some of you may be going through something right now. You need the faith in Jesus that will produce the faith of Jesus. What you're going through right now, God's saying, be patient. Be patient of your experience. This is, making, this is going to make you stronger. It's going to make you better. These, these trials that you are going through are now crafted to make your faith stronger. These are quizzes preparing you for the test. Trust in my word. Trust in my process. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they. They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have the faith of Jesus because they have faith in Jesus. Because they trust the process, their faith in Jesus causes us to have the Holy Spirit so that we can have also the faith of Jesus. A man was sleeping one night in his cabin. And suddenly his room filled with light and God appeared. The Lord told the man he had work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. So this man did day after day. And for many years, he toiled from sun up to sundown. His shoulders set squarely against the cold, massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. And each night, the man returned to his cabin sore and, and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. Since the man was showing discouragement, the adversary, Satan, decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into his very mind. He says, you, you have been pushing against that rock for a long time and it hasn't moved out. Thus, he, he gave the man the impression that the task was impossible and, and that he was a failure. These thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. And Satan said, why, why kill yourself over this? Just, just put in your time, giving just the minimum effort, and that will be good enough. That's what the weary man planned to do, but decided to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I have labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do that which you have asked. Year, yet after all this time, I have not even budged that rock by half a millimeter. What's wrong? Why am I failing? The Lord responded compassionately. My friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, which, which you have done. Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push, and now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you have failed? But is that really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your back sinew and brown. Your hands are closed from constant pressure. Your, your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition, you have grown much, and your abilities now surpass that which you have used to have. True, you haven't moved the rock, but your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. That you have done. Now I, my friend, will move the rock. God will move the rock. 
I mean, whatever you're going through right now, the, the trial and the tribulation on the job, in your family, he says, listen, push. He says, this is going to make you stronger, but don't give up. I know it seems hard right now. Don't give up. Don't, don't give up on the church. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on that friend. Don't, don't give up on that ministry. Don't give up. Don't give up on your salvation. It may not be what you want to be, but have faith to believe that you will be everything that God said that you will be. This is why Hebrews 10, 35 to 39 can say, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. But the, what it says, now the just shall live by what? Faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure with him. Because it's impossible to please God unless you have faith. But be, we are not those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And he sings in the house today. He said, I want to be that individual. I want to be patient to the end, to be a keeper of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. Same faith that Jesus had on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? took on our sin and became our sin bearer, our substitute. And you can imagine Jesus himself felt forsaken. But he had faith in God's word. He knew that God said that he will have to go through this through mankind, but it will be well as a result with their soul. Do we want that victory, family? In those dreadful hours, amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had rallied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance given him. He was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice. He understood God's mercy. He understood God's love. And by faith, Jesus Christ on the cross rested in him whom it had been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God and the sense of the loss of his father's favor was as a result withdrawn. It says by faith, Christ was victor. That's the faith of Jesus. He didn't see beyond the cross, but he believed in God's word. And that's the faith that God wants us to have. Though we're going through trial and tribulation, don't look at your circumstance right now. He says, see beyond your cross. God's got you, family. God's got you, but it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith, clinging on to Jesus. Faith, here is the patience of the, here is the, patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If you're here and you want to say, I want to walk in victory today, Pastor. If you're here and you want to say, I want to walk in victory. Why don't you stand with me? You want to say, I, I want to walk in that same victory of Jesus Christ. I want to have the faith of Jesus. I want to have the faith of Jesus, that, that faith, that yes, it begins with faith in Jesus. I, I believe that he has done a work in me. You got to believe it. It's nothing that you can do. He's already done the work. But then he gives us power through his Holy Spirit. And as a result of that Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and, and as we're learning how to receive uh, that power through, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that as we're preparing for right now as a world where we can proclaim this message more fully, even the Sabbath truth. He promises that if we have the faith in Jesus, he will then give us the faith of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father God, Thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us, your people. You have done a work, Lord God, on this earth 2,000 years ago through your son, Jesus Christ. 
that gives us hope, that gives us comfort, that gives us peace. I pray, Father, Lord God, that we would not, Lord God, lay, uh, let go of this faith, Lord God, this, this faith, this, this love, Lord God, this good news that you've given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. That we'll continue to believe that it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And as a result of what you have done for us, Lord God, and this love being motivated, now this motivated, motivational exchange in our hearts, Lord God, you would then, Lord God, turn our hearts towards you. Re repentance, Lord God, taking place, Lord God. We'll submit and surrender to your word and receive your Holy Spirit. So then through your Holy Spirit, God, you would give your people the power to live the life that you desire us to live. That's the only way it's going to happen. The trials, Lord God, ahead, Lord God, are going to reveal that not I, but Christ. We need something out of ourselves to help us, and that's Jesus, to come inside of us so that we can stand through the trials and the tribulations in victory, in peace, knowing that there is a loving God who cares for us and loves us, and even during the time of no buy, no sell, you promise that you'll take care of all of our needs. That's good news, oh God, we're depending on you. And so as we are going through quizzes right now, prepare us for the final test. Bless your people, I pray. Faith is the victory. Amen. Hymn. Faith is the victory. Hymn number 
from it. What I took, and I hope you took your part as well, is that there is a storm that is coming. The song, hymn number 534, asks the question, will your anchor hold when the storms of life unfold? When the clouds unfold and the wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded, firm and deep. We have an anchor. This anchor is the faith of Jesus. Now, friends, brethren, is the time to get, develop, cultivate that faith. Because when the troubles come, we can't develop it. So, as you ponder on these things, bow your head with me as we go. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is gracious, if there be any excellence, if there be anything worthy of this praise, think on these things. Loving Lord God and Father, your man servant has spoken. Help us, Lord, not to forget what he has said to us, but may it find root in the fleshy parts of our hearts. As we go now from your presence, from each other, take us home safely, I pray, and bring us back to Ewa later and to business meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. until ushered out. Go! 
Everybody say, I tried him 